Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Beach House 34 True Crime and Paranormal Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Worth. Now, today we are continuing with the Darley Routier trial, and we are on January 17th of 1997. And today we start off with the testimony of Barbara Jovell. Now, in the last episode, it was actually her mom that had testified. And as we'll find out, there's a little bit of discrepancies between the mother and daughter's testimony. And Barbara's testimony is actually quite long. It runs uh, over, well over 100 pages. So just like James Cron, this is going to be broken up into several different sections, but I'm going to attempt to get to them as quickly as possible. So with that said, let's get on with it. Before we get into this the actual testimony of Barbara Jovell, it's very important that you know that the first 25 minutes of the quote-unquote testimony you're going to hear is actually not done in front of the jury. The jury is not present at this time. And I will make note when the jury is brought back into the courtroom. So we begin with the testimony of Barbara Jovell. And it actually starts with Mr. John Hagler of the defense team saying, Your Honor, we have one matter about the last witness we talked to you about. You said you would allow us to make the objection after she had testified. And the court then says, Oh, yes. Okay. Mr. Hagler then continues. And at this point, we would object to the admission of the evidence of the testimony regarding the defendant's alleged statement that she was in need of $10,000. And our objection to that point was prior to that offer and the admission in evidence of that testimony. And that objection was that it was irrelevant and confusing and misleading to the jury. And, as I recall, the court overruled that objection and allowed us to make the objection at this time. And the court then says, overruled. Mr. Hagler continues, and furthermore, we would submit that even if relevant, the prejudicial effect would vastly outweigh any probative value. The court then says, all right, overruled. Mr. Hagler then says, note our exception. The court then says, go ahead. Let's get started with this, Mr. Shook. At this point, Barbara Jovell is called as a witness for the state of Texas, and she has been sworn in to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the direct examination then begins by Mr. Toby Shook. And the question is, state your name, please. My name is Barbara Jovell, J-O-V-E-L-L. Miss Jovell, do you know a woman by the name of Darley Routier? Yes, I do. How long have you known her? I've known her since about 87. Okay. And you're friends with her? Yes, I am. Let me turn your attention to May of 96 and ask if you went to her home to talk to her about an incident that had happened. Yes. Okay. And did you talk to her in her home that day about something that happened while you were on vacation? Yes. Okay. Tell the court the conversation you had with the defendant on that day. Darley had told me she was trying to attempt a... Okay. Did she tell you how that happened? Yes. She told me that she had pills out of the wrappers and she was going to take them and she was writing a note, but Darren walked in and she put things away. She hid from him and she, if it wasn't for the dog, Domain, dragging the wrappers from under the bed, Darren would have never known. Okay. Did she tell you why she was about to commit Because sometimes she gets to feel really strange and she doesn't understand why. That things were getting to her. Sometimes she felt like everybody expected too much of her and there was more. Pretty much that things were happening and she felt strange and she just didn't understand why. And sometimes she just feels like she wants to end it all. And I have asked her. I have told her that she had three beautiful children and a loving husband and that she should get help. And she told me that, yes, that she had talked with Darren and that she is going to go with the three children to Lubbock. Okay, let me stop you there. Did you counsel with her about that after she told you about her thinking about or preparing to commit? 
Yes. Now, let me move you forward a little bit and ask you to go to the date of June 7th after Darlie Routier was in the hospital that Friday. Did you go to the hospital and see her? Yes, sir. Okay. At one point in time, while you were at the hospital visiting her, did Darlie Routier ask other members, other people in the room, to leave? Yes, sir. Okay. Did she have a conversation? The court then speaks up and says, Ma'am, can you keep your voice up so that everybody can hear you? The witness then says, Okay. Yes, sir. Is that better? The court then says, Just relax. Yes. Okay. Mr. Shook then continues, Did she have a conversation with you after the others left? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell the judge what she told you at that time. She was concerned about her sexual toys being in the house and police searching the house. Okay. Did she tell you anything else at that time? No. And I have asked you not to go into another matter. Yes. No, she didn't. Unless the judge specifically told you. Right. So don't even mention that at this time. Okay. Okay. And did you, what did you tell her in response to that? That she shouldn't worry about it. That she just lost her two children and she almost lost her life. And that shouldn't matter. That she shouldn't even worry about those things. Now, I'm sure everybody, a lot of people have those things. Okay. Now then, let me move you forward about a week later on the next Friday, June 14th. Did you... Go to the gravesite where the two children were buried. Yes, I have. Did you do that at Darley's request? Yes, sir. Okay. And was there some type of birthday party there at the gravesite? Yes, sir. Okay. And were you present when a news team was out there filming that birthday party? Yes, sir, I was. Do you remember who the news reporter was that was doing that? I remember his name was Joe. Okay. Joe Munoz? I believe so. That was his last name. Okay. And did he interview Darley and Darren Routier? Yes, he had. Okay. And were you present during those interviews? Yes, I was. And did you hear them talking to the reporter Joe Munoz? Yes, sir, I did. And at that party, was Silly String shot over the grave and did you all sing happy birthday? Yes, we did. Okay. And were you there at Darley Routier's request? Yes. Okay. And was all of that celebration filmed there by Channel 5 and Joe Munoz and his team? Yes. You were all present during all that? Yes, I was. Were you just off camera? I was trying to be off camera. Okay. Now, but you were, you heard the conversations between the three of them, did you not? Yes. As they were being interviewed? Pretty much so. Yes, I heard, but I don't remember exactly what was, I mean, you didn't memorize every word? No. Okay. And if I showed you a tape of that interview, and you have reviewed that this morning, is that right? Yes, I did. Okay. And did that tape, let me show you what has been marked as States Exhibit 101. Did that tape, was that a tape of the interview that you have just described to the judge? Yes. Okay. And was that tape an accurate representation of what went on there as far as the interview and what Darley did? Yes. What Darley said? Yes. And you were just off camera watching all that. Is that right? Yes. Okay. At this point, Mr. Toby Shook then offers State's Exhibit 101 for record purposes and wants to play that for the court and offer it for admissibility before the jury. So at this point, the tape is then played for the court. The court then says, all right, that is the tape you want to show, Mr. Shook? Yes, sir. And those are the three specific areas that the defense indicated to me that they wanted a hearing on. The court then says, all right, Mr. Hagler, I assume you want to make an objection? Mr. Hagler then says, yes, your honor. The court says, okay, you can take one at a time, whatever areas, one at a time. Mr. Hagler then says, okay, your honor, the first area is going to be this testimony regarding the alleged attempt. As the court well knows, the burden is on the state to make a threshold showing to the court and establish beyond a reasonable doubt 
that the existence of this extraneous offense, and we would classify this as an extraneous offense. I say extraneous offense. I'm talking about 404-B material, Your Honor. We would submit, Your Honor, number one, that they have failed to make such a showing. And in particular, Your Honor, number one, they have not. May I put this book up here, Your Honor? The court says, oh, by all means. Mr. Hegler then says, Your Honor, they haven't made an adequate showing of an actual intent on the part of the defendant to commit. And furthermore, Your Honor, and I know the court is well aware of the concept or the definition of relevant evidence, but we would submit further, in addition to their failure to make a threshold showing beyond a reasonable doubt of the conduct of the defendant. Furthermore, Your Honor, we would vigorously urge that this testimony regarding alleged is simply not relevant. And again, I know the court is well aware of the definition, but just for the purpose of this hearing, I would like to again state that the definition means evidence having any tendency to make the existence of any fact that is of consequence to the determination of the action more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence. Your Honor, I don't see any way, shape, or form that this testimony regarding an alleged attempt would have any bearing, would have any, would have any probative value to a determination as to whether or not the defendant is guilty of the charge alleged in the indictment. In other words, there is simply no nexus. There was no connection between the so-called statements regarding, really it was not even a attempt. It's some statements regarding some future intent to, I guess, to commit suicide. But there's no nexus. There is no connection between this testimony and the allegations contained in the indictment. So we would vigorously urge under 401 that such testimony is not admissible. The court then says, all right, are you through with that one? Mr. Hagler says, yes, your honor. The court says, okay, well, the court will overrule that objection and admit that. Mr. Hagler then says, well, and furthermore, your honor, under 404-B, it's conduct, which we would submit that it's 404-B type material. As the court well knows, it extends into any type of bad acts, what have you, that would cast an aspersion of doubt on the defendant's conduct. The court then says, well, the court feels it would tend to show a state of mind, and the court would hold that the probative value far outweighs any prejudicial effect. Mr. Mosty then says, could I be sure that Mr. Hagler has developed that these this alleged event is more than 30 days removed from the offense, and that is part of our objection. The court then says, that is fine. Mr. Mosty says, that the time factor of the removal. And secondly, that he's via v a homicide, that there is no relevance, that there is no connection between those from a psychiatric standpoint and a psychological standpoint. The court then says, the court understands your objection, same ruling overruled. Now let's move on to the next one. Mr. Hagler then says, Your Honor, the second area, as I understood the testimony, was the hospital visit regarding the so-called sex toys. I am not going to spend too much time on this area, Your Honor, because I don't see any way, shape, or form that this could possibly be relevant. The court then says, It's not an offense. I'll overrule that. Mr. Hagler says, Well, Your Honor, let's put it this way. I'm not arguing specifically as to an extraneous offense, but I'm arguing or submitting to the court that the existence of, I'm not sure what is meant by sexual toys. Again, I think that in itself it is vague, but it's unclear, it's confusing, it is going to be misleading to the jury. And then it certainly couldn't have any relevance or any bearing on whether or not, in fact, the defendant had any so-called sexual toys what that would have any bearing or any significance as to whether she committed the offense. Furthermore, I would urge that it would be 404B material. And again, it's conduct that casts a bad light on the defendant. Obviously, Your Honor, they are attempting to put this into evidence, and they are obviously doing it for some reason. And the reason why they are doing it is they want to show, they want to cast a shadow on the defendant on areas that are simply irrelevant. The court then says, Mr. Mosty, do you have something you want to say? Mr. Mosty then says, Mr. Hagler just hit it. 
The court then says, all right, overruled, I'll admit that. So now, I guess the next area is on the tape. The third area by Mr. Hagler, Your Honor, is the going to be the tape. Starting off with the authentication. I think this witness has already stated that she doesn't recall. She was simply present during this graveside matter. As far as the authentication, the threshold of requirement that the state carries. We would submit that obviously the tape itself is not self-authenticating. They are required to properly authenticate it through proper evidence and testimony. Under our rules 901 and 902 and rule 1001 and 1001 through 1004. One is we don't, all we have here is a tape that they played. We know the name of apparently the reporter who was present and who interviewed the defendant and her husband. We don't know what the chain of custody the tape has been. We don't know the manner and circumstances by which the tape was recorded. We don't know whether or not there were any additions or alterations to the tape since the time of its recording until the time it is being played in the courtroom at the present time. We don't know whether there have been any alterations or changes, deletions or additions to the tape, and therefore, at the outset, they have simply failed to satisfy their threshold requirement to establish and to authenticate the admission of the tape into evidence. Now, moving on with, would the court want to rule on that? The court then says, well, I will rule on that one. I will overrule that and I will admit the tape. Mr. Hagler then says, okay, and again, Your Honor, I want to point out that the witness testified that she may have been present. I don't know how much she heard. She simply said that she was present, and in fact, she has even admitted that she doesn't recall word for word what the statements were and what was said during the graveside matter. The court says, I'll overrule that because she appears throughout the tape, and the tape speaks for itself on the screen. You can plainly see her there. You can plainly see everyone involved, both Routiers and Mr. Munoz, who is also on the tape. You can hear his voice and you can see him. He is sitting in the courtroom right now. So I will overrule that and I will admit the tape. Mr. Hagler says, well, Your Honor, a few more objections. And the court then says, oh, a few more. Okay. Mr. Hagler says, Your Honor, in addition... There are numerous. One of the requirements on authentication is to identify the various voices on the tape. Your Honor, in addition to the defendant's voice, obviously, there are going to be some areas where there is no question that the defendant is speaking, but there are numerous voices on this tape. Background voices, voices of unidentified individuals who we have no idea who they are, who is making the statements and what have you. And therefore, we would object to the fact that that, again, it shows a lack of authentication. And furthermore, the numerous statements on the tape constitute hearsay testimony under Rule 802, and specifically the background voices, and also the statements by Darren Routier are going to be hearsay under Rule 802. The court then says, okay, overruled, next. Mr. Hagler then says, moving on, Your Honor, and again, this basically gets back to my earlier statements having to do with the so-called alleged statement and future intent. Your Honor, the tape itself that was made a number of days after the offense alleged in this indictment, we would submit, Your Honor, that there has been no showing of any relevancy. It does not constitute any type of evidence or adds any probative value if, in fact, it was presented before the jury. And therefore, we would urge that each and all of the statements contained in the tape fail to satisfy the relevancy test under Rule 401. The court then says, all right, overruled. And you will not be required to, is that all? Mr. Hagler then says, no, Your Honor. The court says, oh, we're still going. All right. Mr. Hagler says, in addition, Your Honor, we would further urge that this tape, even if, and I'd ask for a 403 ruling, in the event the court admits it. The court then says, you will get it, Mr. Hagler says, but we would further submit, Your Honor, that this tape also constitutes 404-B material in the fact that it shows, and I know the state is going to argue that this tape shows a lack of remorse on the part of the defendant, we would submit that this, therefore, it falls into the area of 404-B. And in particular, 
The fact that this tape could be easily, and we would submit will be, and possibly could be misinterpreted by the jury. It's confusing and it's misleading. The fact is that each and every individual reacts differently to a crisis in their life. And this tape, when viewed by the jurors, is going to be misinterpreted by the jurors. And therefore, we would urge that this tape be suppressed because of the fact it will be and could be misconstrued by a juror under 404-B and 403. The court says, okay, are we at the end? Mr. Mosty then says, let me ask you a question. Mr. Hagler says, just one second, Your Honor. The court says, all right, that's it. Mr. Hagler says, yes, Your Honor. Mr. Mosty says, I'll second what Mr. Hagler said. The court then says, all right, the final objection is overruled. The tape will be admitted under Rule 403-B. The probative effect showing state of mind far outweighs any prejudicial value, any prejudicial effect. And the court will note your objections in this hearing, and you will not have to object in front of the jury. All right, are we ready to bring the jury in? Mr. Shook then says, we're ready, Judge. The court then says, all right, then bring the jury in. At this point, the jury is brought back in, and the court then says, all right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let the record reflect that all parties in the trial are present, and the jury is seated. Ladies and gentlemen, this witness has already been sworn outside of your presence, Mr. Shook. And at this point, Mr. Toby Shook says, judge, at this time, the state will offer State's Exhibit 106, and it is certified. And Mr. Mosty then says, no objection. The court then says, all right, state's exhibit number 106 is admitted. And then the direct examination now in front of the jury by uh, Mr. Toby Shook is began, and he's questioning again Barbara Javel. And he says, would you tell us your name, please? My name is Barbara Javel. Okay. Throughout your testimony, please speak in a loud, clear voice. Okay? Yes, sir. If you don't understand anyone's questions, just ask them to repeat it, and we will be glad to do that. Okay? Yes. Keep that voice up. Yes. All right. Where do you live, Miss Jovell? Is it Jovell? Yes. J-O-V-E-L-L. -L. I am pronouncing it right, then? Yes. Where do you live? I live in Dallas, in Garland. Okay. Do you want the whole address? Is Garland a suburb of Dallas? Yes. Where are you originally from? I am originally from Poland. When did you move here to the United States? In 1973. Okay. And did you move here with your family? My father was already here. My mother and my sister came here together. Yes. Is your mother, do you call her Babsia? Everybody else do? I call her mom. Okay. All right. Is she the lady that testified yesterday? Yes. Okay. And when did you move to the Dallas area? Um, around maybe 81 or so. Okay. And what brought you to Texas? I moved in with my ex-husband. I moved with my ex-husband and his family. Okay. Was he your ex-husband then? No. That happened later? Yes. Okay. And have you resided in the Dallas area since that time? Yes, I have. Okay. Did you eventually go to work at a company called Kuplex? Yes, I have. When did you start at that company? Shortly after, about two weeks after I came here. Okay. And tell the jury what type of company Kuplex is. They make printed circuit boards from the scratch to the electrical test. Circuit boards for what? That's the stuff that goes into computers and makes them work. Circuit boards for computers? Yes. All right. And what did you do for Kuplex? I was an electrical test, and I was troubleshooting for problems. Okay. Now, while you worked there, did you come to know a man by the name of Darren Routier? Yes, I have. Okay. About what year was it that you met Darren Routier? Around 87, middle of 87 or so. Okay. Did he come to work there at Kuplex? Yes. About how old was he when you met him? 19, around 19 or so. What did he do there at Kuplex? 
he was working in my area at that time. Okay. Did y'all eventually become friends? Yes. Okay. Did you later come to meet his fiance? Yes, I have. Okay. What was her name? Darley. Do you see Darley here in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. That is her over there. You are pointing to the woman here in the coat here at the council table? Yes. Mr. Shook then says, Your Honor, if the record could reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. The court then says yes. Mr. Shook then continues. Had you already become friends with Darren Routier before you met Darley? I was with Darren friends first. Later on, maybe a few months, maybe a little more, I don't quite remember, but it was a while before I met Darley. Was that sometime in 1987 also? Yes. Okay, how old was Darley Routier when you met her? I believe around 16 or 17. Okay, were they engaged at that time? Yes. After you met her, did you and Darley become friends? Yes. Were Darren and Darley eventually married? Yes. When was that? August 27th, 88. August 27th, 1988? Yes. Okay. Where did that take place? In Lubbock? Were you there? Yes, I was. Did you participate in the ceremony? Pardon me? Did you participate in the ceremony? Yes, I was the maid of honor. Maid of honor for Darley? For Darley, yes. Okay. Did Darren continue to work at Kuplex with you after they were married? Yes. Did Darley come to work there for a while? Yes, after they were married for a little while. How long did she work there? I don't exactly remember, but I remember she was pregnant and she had an accident. Before she had the baby at work there, so she was kind of... They put her with pay to stay home. Okay. Did Darren and Darley have children from their marriage? Yes. How many children did they have? Three. Who was the first? Devin Routier. I'm sorry. Devin Rush Routier. When was he born? June of 89. Okay. Who was the second born? Damon Routier. Damon Christian Routier. When was Damon born? February of 91. Okay. And did they have a third child? Yes, Drake. And he was born October of 95. Okay. Now, did Darren also develop a business on the side when he was at Kuplex? Yes, he had. Okay. What type of business was that? He was not doing testing, but he was building fixtures to test printed circuit boards. Okay. Did he do that out of his home? Yes, he have. Did you help him with that sometimes? Yes, I have. Did you do that just on goodwill or were you paid for your services? I was paid. Did Darley also assist in that type of work? Yes. Okay. Eventually, did Darren leave Kuplex and start his own company? Yes, he had. What was the name of that company? Testneck Electronics. Okay. About what time was that that he started that company? I believe it was around, well, I started working for him sometimes in May or June of 1992. So that was just a little bit before that, that he opened it. You came to work for him as an employee? Yes, I have. Tell the jury what kind of company that was, what you all did at Testneck. We tested printed circuit boards. Same type thing? Yes. Load fixture, drilling. The material is, it's a process that you do, but it was drilling, setting up fixtures, and then testing printed circuit boards for companies. Who worked at the company? For the longest time, it was just Darren and Darley and I. Okay, and what did you do for the company? Well, I did everything. The testing, the cleaning. What did Darley do for the company? She kept the books, and plus she helped sometimes to test when it was very busy. Okay, and did the company started in 92, is that right? Yes, around 1992. I'm pretty sure, well, around 92, because I started working shortly after they opened. Did the company do well when it started off? Yes. Did it do well through 92, 93? Yes. 94? Yes. And most of 95? Yes, pretty much so. 
We had our slow periods sometimes, but usually, and this entire time, is it you, Darren, and Darley, the main employees at Testneck? Yes, but there is, yes, through 94. Well, we had my daughter working there part-time. She was still at school. And there was the time that Julie Clark came for a little while and worked with us too. Primarily, though, it was you, Darren, and Darley. And Darley. Okay. Now, in the last couple of years, did you begin to see a change in Darley Routier? Yes, I have. Okay. Would you tell the jurors what that change was? She was up and down. It was really hard to tell, but she was, she became very materialistic, which I brought up to Darren. I'm sorry. Very much what? Materialistic. She started to begin to love material things. Materialistic? Yes. Okay. She was, well, she had ups and downs. She gets depressed. She gained weight and she started fighting with Darren about money. Okay. Now you say she got materialistic? Yes. Did she become concerned with money and buying things? Yes. She went and bought things a lot. Okay. Now their company was doing pretty good. Is that right? Yes. Okay. But was she different from the Darley you originally met back in 1987? Well, she liked pretty things, and she did like to look well at that time. But it was, well, how do you say it? Well, not as much as I saw later. Now then, did Darley Routier participate in business decisions there at Testneck? Yes, she had. Were you present during conversations involving business there at Testneck? Yes, many times. Okay, and was Mrs. Routier involved in those conversations? Yes. As far as the company goes, was there a big reinvestment in the company for new equipment, things of that nature? At first, the tester was bought, and then later, they only purchase a used drill and then a digitizer. What items were purchased then that you observed with the money that was made there at Testneck? There was nothing more going into Testneck, okay? It was going to Darley. When you say going to Darley, what are you talking about? She loves to shop. She liked to shop? Yes. And what type of things did she start buying? She had wonderful taste. She would buy expensive things. Okay. Did they purchase a new home? Yes. They had a new home built. They built a new home. Yes. Okay. And when was that? Oh, shortly after maybe 93, maybe end of 92. Shortly after we had the company, I'm not for sure. Okay. And who decorated the home? Darley did. All right. Did she purchase other things at that time? Start buying more and more things? Well, furniture, you know, things like that, things for the house. And what about personal things? Well, she buy a lot of beautiful clothes and stuff like that for her and her children. Okay. Any items as far as jewelry goes? Yes, she liked to start buying jewelry. And was that just something that happened the last couple of years? More so. There was a purchase of jewelry more so at that time. Yes. Okay. Now, did you talk to her about the things she was buying? Well, yes. Did you have conversations about that? Well, yes, she showed me. She tell me her ideas and how she is going to decorate, and there were times that I went with her. Okay. Did you talk to Darren about needing new equipment for the company? Yes, I have. Okay. Were you having some problems there with the work you were doing? Well, yes, because I needed pins for grids and... Can you speak up? I needed pins for grids because the grid was too small and some of the types of jobs that we did was larger and I had to stop test which is not very good, and the tester needed to be fixed because it was lopsided a lot of times. Okay, was that, was money paid for that tester to be fixed or any new equipment bought? He tried to, you know, kind of wiggle jiggle the tester to kind of make it work, but no new equipment was brought in regards to that? No, sir. All right. Now, in late 95, did business slacken off there at Tusnet? Yes, it had. Okay. And did it pick up at the beginning of 96 at all? 
Not really. We were slow, a lot slower than we have ever been. Did you have a real long slow period at that time? Very long. Did that slow period extend into, well, we still have some jobs. We didn't get new jobs. When we do repeat jobs, it's just cheap. We have to get new jobs for us to make money. So we get mostly repeats and hardly any new jobs. So the business was slow through 96? Yes. Okay. Now, did that cause another change in Darley Routier's attitude when the business slackened off? Yes. Okay. What happened with Darley at that time? She was nervous and depressed, and she fought with Darren a lot. Okay. Did you witness a lot of these fights and arguments? Arguments, yes. Okay. They didn't physically hit each other, did they? No, I have never seen them hit each other. Did these arguments become frequent? Yes. And what were the arguments over that you witnessed? Money. Concerning what about money? Because money wasn't coming in and there were lots of bills to pay. There was just no money. There was enough, as Darren put it to me, quote, oh, I am paying you by Mr. Hagler then says, I'm going to object to the statement by Darren hearsay. The court says, I'll sustain the objection. The witness says, I'm sorry, what did I do? The court says, that's okay, don't worry. They are going to object all the time. I will rule on them. Well, they will make, I mean, both sides will make appropriate objections. I will rule on those. And then you just go on back and we will tell you when to stop and when not to stop. The witness then says, okay. The court says, but we have a hearsay rule. The witness says, okay. And the court states, don't say what other people said. The witness says, oh, okay. The court says, you just say what you know. Don't worry, just keep going. We'll go through it. And then she continues. The money was slowing down and Darley was upset, depressed. Yes, she fought a lot with Darren, and sometimes she will become calm, and things will be all right, and then it starts up again, because Mr. Shook then says, did these fights increase once business slowed down? Yes, okay. Now, was Darley Routier working up there full time at that time? No, not really. She just comes sometimes. Okay. And what did she do when she came up there? What was her role? Well, she came just came in sometimes, and my daughter was doing some paperwork, but Darley was doing, I don't exactly know for sure, but invoices or something like that to do with bookkeeping and things, stuff, you know, and then she would be on the phone shopping. Still shopping? Yes. Was she still in on the business decisions with the company? Yes, she was. You have come to know Darley and Darren Routier pretty well over the years, haven't you? Yes. Who is the more dominant personality between those two? Darley was. Okay. And did Darley have a temper? Yeah. What kinds of things would get her mad? Well, sometimes she wanted some Mr. Hagler then says, Your Honor, we will object. This is irrelevant. She has already expressed an opinion. We are going to object to the details as being irrelevant. The court then says, Overruled. Go ahead if you know. The witness then says, Where was I? Can you repeat that question? Mr. Shook says, you said she had a temper. What kinds of things would get her mad? Well, if Darren, well, she apparently didn't show my daughter how to do that little part of the invoices or something. So Tammy told me, well, now let me stop you there. Don't go into what maybe Tammy told you or Darren told you. Well, as to the money, to get the money out of the customers, money or mostly money. Okay. Now, did you become worried about the way Darley was acting and her emotional state? Yes, I was. Okay, and did you speak to Darren specifically about that? Yes, I have. Okay. Now, without going into anything that Darren said, tell the jury what you told Darren. I have told Darren that, don't you see what's going on? Darley was able to take care of the house, the children, and some, and the business. And I said, don't you see lately she cannot, she has maids clean the house, she has people do the laundry, she has people to help with the children. There is something bothering Darley, something is wrong. Did you give him advice as to what he should do? To get help. What do you mean by get help? 
to do anything, to go see a doctor or maybe somebody she could talk to because something bad will happen. And about what time was this in 96? That was before I left for my vacation at the end of, go ahead, at the end of April and the beginning of May, I went on vacation at the end of April and that was happening at that time. So you went on vacation at the end of April of 96? Yes. And this conversation that you just related to the jury that you told Darren happened before you went on vacation? Yes. Okay. Did Darley sometimes bring the children up to the shop? Yes, she had. Do you recall an incident when she brought the boys up to the shop around this same time period? Sometimes with just the baby and Damon mostly because Devin was still at school. Okay. Do you recall the times she brought the boys up and wanted Darren to take care of them? Well, she had errands to run, so we would keep an eye on the children. Okay. Let me turn your attention now to when you got back from your vacation. When did you get back from your vacation? In May. Probably, I know, the first week of May I was gone, and then I came back along that time. Okay. When you got back, did you have a talk with your daughter, Tammy? Don't go into anything that was said, but did you have a talk? Yes, I have. Was she still working at Tesnek at that time? Yes. Did you also have a discussion with Darren on that day? Yes. Subsequent to that talk, did you go see Darley Routier? Yes, I have. Okay. And when did you go see her after that talk? I went to see her at her house. Okay. And who was there at the house? Just her, the baby, and Damon. Okay. And what did you talk to her about when you went to? And this was going to be in May, I take it, when you got back? Yes, I got back in May. So when I came back, what I have learned, I got concerned and I wanted to talk with Darren and make sure that she was all right. What did she tell you that had happened while you were on vacation? She told me that she was trying to commit suicide. Did she tell you how that happened? Yes, she said that she was just going to do it. She had all the pills out of the wrappers and she was just, she was writing a note. And then she heard Darren come in and she put things away very quickly and threw some wrappers under the bed. And if it wasn't for Domain, the dog, Darren would have never known. And because Domain was, he started playing with the wrappers and taking them out from under the bed. Did you ask her why she was going to do that? Yes. What did she say? I told her that she needs to get help because she has three beautiful children and a good husband, and if she does something to herself, what would her children think that their mama didn't love them? Did she tell you why she was going to commit suicide? Yes, because sometimes she didn't understand how she felt. She sometimes, she felt strange and that things got too much for her, and sometimes she just felt like wanting to end it all, and she doesn't understand it. So I told her to please get help, and she told me that she already discussed it with Darren and that she was going to take the three children and go to Lubbock and that Cyrilda was going to take care of her three children when she goes. Who is Cyrilda? Cyrilda is her mother-in-law, okay? But then she turned around and told me that she don't know about it because how does she know that is going to help her? And I told her that she doesn't have to. If she doesn't like it, that she could get maybe a counseling a little bit and maybe to put her on a little medication to see what is bothering her. And if she doesn't like it, she could always refuse and maybe see somebody else. And she says, well, she was kind of afraid because she said that if anything ever happens between her and Darren, that Cyrilda may take the children away from her. And I says, because she would be in the hospital, you know, to help her mentally. And I told her that she shouldn't worry about it because she, she will be going on her own, saying that something is bothering me and I want to know what it is. Did she talk to you about the weight she had gained and that was bothering her also? Yes, it bothered her very much. What did you tell her about that? Oh, that she makes me sick. Such a beautiful young woman with three children. To me, she looked beautiful. And I said she was just giving herself a complex and that would make her sick. 
Did you also talk about the money situation and the slow business there at Testnet? Yes, I showed her that, well, she was worried because that was the longest period that we had that was so slow. And she did have big bills. But I have told her, hey, you know, things will pick up. Things will be all right. You just go get your help and me and Darren will get with it. Things will pick up and things will be all right for her not to worry about that, for her to worry about her. Did she express some concern about the bills that were coming in and about the house? No, not really. She mostly said the children sometimes were too much and the neighbors wanted to play there. And I told her, I said, people expect so much of her. I told her that people could expect all they want. She could only deliver what she can. And for the children to tell their mothers for a change to let them play over there. And she said that she did mention it, but she goes, well, sometimes I don't really mind and sometimes it gets too much. Now, did she seem to get somewhat better after that visit that you had with her? Yes, somewhat, but did she go to Lubbock and follow your advice? No. Did she get on any medication to help her with her weight? Well, the only thing she got on was diet pills. She got on diet pills? Yes, sir. Let me turn your attention to early June and ask if... I'm sorry? It's okay. Did you talk to Darley about your mother coming to work for her? Darley called me. Okay. What did Darley say to you when she called you? She asked me to if my mother would consider coming and helping her out by working, helping her, you know, with laundry and light housekeeping. And what did you say to Darley? I told her that I would talk to my mother. I have to talk with her and what days if she agrees. Had Darley had people help clean and watch her children before this? Yes. Okay. How soon before this had that been going on? She had a maid, but I'm not for sure. I think, well, I believe that she let her go before even my mom arrived to Texas. Okay. Did your mother agree to go over there and do the housework for Darley? Well, I kind of asked my mom to. I asked my mom and we talked and she agreed to work for Darley three days. I don't exactly remember if Darley picked those days or my mom. I believe my mom or Darley, maybe Darley picked those days. It was Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Okay, did you take your mother over there on that Tuesday, June the 4th? Yes, I have. And when you dropped your mother off, did you pick anyone up? Darren. Okay, why did you pick Darren up? I believe he left the Pathfinder for Darley, if she needs it. Since I dropped my mom off, it was easy for him to ride with me. Did Darren have a car? It was a Jaguar, yes. What was wrong with that car at that time? It broke down. How long had it been broken down? Oh, I don't remember, but shortly, not... I don't really remember. It broke down just around that time. So you gave him a ride to work that day? Yes. Okay. And did you give your mother a ride over to Darley's the next day, that Wednesday, June 5th? Yes, I did. Okay. And did you give Darren a ride to work on that day? I don't remember. Okay. About what time did you return on Wednesday to pick your mother up? Around maybe 5.15 or so, somewhere around that time. Okay. Who was at the house when you went to pick her up? My mother and Darley. Where were they? They were in the kitchen. And what did you? I came in the kitchen and I spoke to them. I said, hey, it looks nice. And they said, yeah, that they did everything. Everything was cleaned up and the only thing Darley had to do is pick up. There was, everything was cleaned and washed. But there was clothes on the kitchen cabinet counter still folded up that Darley was supposed to bring upstairs. Okay. Did you want to stay there when you got there? Yes, I felt pretty good. And I wanted to stay a few minutes and talk to Darley. Okay. Did you get anything to drink? Yes, I had a beer. Okay. And did you sit down? Pardon me? Where did you sit down? I really didn't sit down. I was kind of around the kitchen island, you know, one of the deals that sits in the middle of your kitchen. Would that be island there? Yes, I was kind of around there and I don't remember. I was kind of, yeah, around that on both sides, kind of moving around. 
Now, did you decide to stay there or did you leave soon after that? I believe I had a beer and my mom was rushing me to leave. Your mom wanted to get out of there? Yes. What mood was Darley in when you left that house? She was upset. How do you know she was upset? She was going back and forth and she was upset. You say going back and forth. Are you talking about walking? Yes, she was pacing back and forth and she was upset. And I have seen Darley upset, so I know that something was wrong. Okay, you have seen her in that mood before. Yes, and she was upset. And, you know, she was still kind of moving around. She didn't really want to continue conversations with me. Or maybe a few things were said, but I don't quite remember. All I remember is I walked in and I have two nerved up women. You had what? Two nerved up women, my mom and Darley. My mom saying, let's get out, let's get out. So they were both upset. And Darley is pacing, doing something, but she is not really doing, I don't know what she is doing, but she is going back and forth. Okay. Now, did you soon then leave the house with your mother? Yes, I have. Okay. Where did you park your car? I parked my car out front of the house. Okay. As you drove off, did you see any other cars coming down the street? Yes, I have. What cars did you see? I saw a black car passing by us really fast. Okay. It passed by you? It passed us really fast. I was going slow, and we were going to turn to Linda Vista from Eagle Drive, and we were just not too far from going towards Linda Vista before we turned, and that is when the car went really fast, passing by us. Okay, describe that car, please. It's a black car with a, the back of the, it was tinted windows, the back of the car. The window was kind of straight, and there was a short trunk, and then, you know, short, going down like that, kind of sporty look. Short trunk? Yes, okay. Did you see who was driving the car? No, sir, I have not. And when the car drove by, did it upset your mother? Yes, it did. Did you see Darren Routier anywhere around the, at that time also? As we were leaving, I believe we waved to him and Dana. Who is Dana? Dana is Darley's sister. And how old is she? I believe she is around 15 or 16. Were they on their way to the house from work? Yes. Well, they already left work before me because, okay, they were on their way home then. Yes, I'm sorry. That's all right. Now then, that was Wednesday evening, early Thursday morning. Did you get a phone call? Yes, I have. Okay. About what time was that? Around three o'clock in the morning. Okay. Who called you? My daughter. Okay. And after you got that phone call, where did you go? I went to Darley's house. When you got to Darley's house, what was going on? There was a bunch of, there was police cars, fire trucks, the house was taped off. Okay. Did you talk with someone there at the, in front of the residence? Yes, I talked with my daughter and Dana a little bit, and then I talked to a policeman. And did you leave the front of the house and go somewhere else at that time? I went to the hospital. Okay. Which hospital did you go to? Dallas Baylor. Okay. Eventually that day, did you get in to see Darley Routier? Yes, I have. Where was she when you saw her? In intensive care room. Okay. And do you recall what time of the day it was when you were talking to her? We were there practically all day or half a day. I had to, Darren had us leave and check on the business with Dana. We were there most of the morning, and we left after we saw Darren. Not really after, though. It was sometime we were the, through. There was sometime later that day, maybe evening, maybe somewhere around, maybe evening. So you were there a while, left to help out something with Darren, and then came back? Went and came back. Yes. Okay. When were you there the first time? Did you talk to Darley? Yes. Okay. Did she tell you what had happened to her? Yes. Tell the jury what she told you had happened to her. She told me that she heard Damon going, Mommy, Mommy. He leaned on her saying, Mommy, Mommy. 
and she felt pressure on her legs and she opened her eyes and the man was coming down straight with a knife at her throat. And then if she didn't put her arm up, he would have killed her. Then what did she say happened? Damon, she didn't see nothing more, but she says that she picks up, maybe I'm not remembering correctly, but Damon was following her. She was going after a man through the kitchen. It was the kitchen. She was going after the man. And Damon was behind her and she told, she pushed him and told him to go back, to wait for mommy, just wait for mommy. And she went out to the garage and that's all she said. Okay. Did you go up to the hospital the next day on Friday? Yes, I did. Were there lots of other friends and relatives in her room? Yes. At one point in time, did Darley ask, well, did Darley make a request there in the room? Yes. She asked everybody to leave the room, but for me to stay behind. Okay. Did everyone comply with her request? Yes. Okay. So who was left in the room? Just Darley and I. And then what happened? Nothing at first. She was, we had eye contact for the longest time and we had eye contact for the longest time and it kind of scared me because I told her something bad is happening. I don't know. I sat down next to her and I said, Darlie, please talk to me. What's going on? Please talk to me. And what did she say at that time? She told me that she had sexual toys in the house and that the police going to see them. What did you tell her about that? I told her that, my God, you shouldn't worry about those things. The babies were killed and you almost got killed. You think they weren't, that they are going to worry about the toys? I told her a lot of people have toys and that was her private thing. Let me turn your attention to the next week. Did you see Darley again? The court then interjects and says, just a minute, ma'am. You have been on the stand a long time. Would you like to take a little break? She then says, no, I'm fine. And the court says, okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. The witness then says, I'll be okay. I'm sorry. Court says, nope, there's no problem. If you want to take a little break, we can take a little break. All right, thank you. Go ahead, please. Mr. Shook then continues. Did you see Darley again after she was out of the hospital at her mother's house? Yes, I have. Okay, was that sometime the next week? Yeah, following week, yes. Okay. And did you visit with her there at her mother's house? Yes, I have. What is her mother's name? Darley Key. Her name is Darley also? Yes. It's Darley Key? Yes. We call her Mama Darley. Okay. Did Darley again talk to you about the attack and what happened to her? Yes. Okay. Tell the jury what she told had you happened when you had this conversation at her mother's house. Well. I didn't ask her anything. She was just sitting there. She was really nervous. She was, of course, chewing on her fingernails. And I went, don't do that. And she says, she said, she says, Baja, Baja. She says, when I opened, when I felt pressure on my, go ahead, just take your time. You should, she says, Baja, when I felt pressure on my legs and I opened my eyes, the man apparently was sitting on top of her and he was doing this with the knife on her face. Rubbing the knife on her face? Yes, something like, she showed me something like this. What did she say? She's, and she said, Basha, he looked like he enjoyed himself, Basha. And I said, Darly, Darly, please remember the face. Please remember that enjoyable face. She told me she couldn't. So she said the man looked like he was enjoying himself. You asked her to remember his face? Remember that enjoyable face, please. Darley, remember that face. Did she tell you what he looked like? He had short hair. He had short hair. And he was tall. And he was kind of chubby around the sides. And he was white. Was she able to describe his face at all? No. She said she was in shock and that the doctor is going to put her under, under hypnosis to help her remember. Okay, but right now she was too weak and she lost a lot of blood. Now, let me turn your attention to that Friday, June 14th, 1996. Did Darley ask you to go somewhere on that day? She asked me to go to the cemetery. What was that day? It was Devin's birthday. Devin's birthday? Yes. And did she ask you to come to the cemetery? Yes, she have. 
Okay, why did she want you to come to the cemetery? Mr. Hagler then says, Your Honor, may I approach the bench? The court then says, Yes, you may. And so at this point, a discussion is held off the record outside of the jury. And of course, it's not contained within the transcript. And after they're finished, the proceedings were resumed. And Mr. Shook continues his questioning. That was Devin's birthday? Yes. And what did she ask you to do? She asked me to come to the cemetery. And what was the reason for coming to the cemetery? Because they were going to celebrate Devin's birthday. Did you want to go to the cemetery? I wanted to go alone. I told Darley that I was going to go alone afterward and tell him happy birthday in heaven. Okay. Did you agree with Darley's request? Yes, I have. And why did you agree to her request? I agreed that I am going to go with them at 6.30 to the cemetery. I meet them at the cemetery at 6.30. Did you take anyone with you when you went there? I took my mother and David. Okay. And was Darley there? I believe we were the first ones to arrive and Darley shortly after. I don't remember exactly. We all slowly were coming in. Okay. And did a news team also arrive shortly thereafter and film the events that happened there? Yes, sir. And were you present when those events were filmed? Yes. And did they talk to Darren and Darley Routier? Yes, they have. And were you present when those interviews took place? Yes, I was. Okay. Let me, well, you have reviewed that film. You reviewed it this morning a couple of times, haven't you? Yes, I have. Okay. And did the film that you saw, which is marked here as States Exhibit 101, did that accurately reflect the interviews that you witnessed? Yes, it does. Okay. Mr. Shook then says, Your Honor, at this time we will offer States Exhibit 101 for all purposes. The court then says, All right, States Exhibit 101 will be admitted. Mr. Shook then says, And we will ask the court's permission to play the tape at this time. The court then says, you may play it, and then says, can all members of the jury see this screen? And the jury says, yes. The court says, all right, thank you. And Mr. Shook then says, can everyone see the screen? Can you see the screen? Basha. The court then says, are you able to see the screen? The witness says, yes, I can. The court says, all right. And at this point, the videotape is played in the courtroom. Happy birthday to you. For some, this may seem a strange thing to do in an odd place and time. Happy birthday, dear Devin. Singing happy birthday in a cemetery to a son who was brutally stabbed to death just over a week ago. Love you, Devin and Damon. But Darley and Darren Routier say this is appropriate for them and their family. Helium balloons instead of headstones to remember Devin, who would have turned seven today. And he would take a little paper and he was painting on his cards. Just change them up from what they were before. He and his five-year-old brother Damon were stabbed to death, their mother wounded by someone she describes as a white man wearing dark clothes. She was downstairs with the boys, Darren, in an upstairs bedroom with infant son, Drake. They were unharmed. The young mother says she feels horrible she did not wake up immediately when her children were attacked first. All I was thinking about was trying to save the babies. I mean, Darren and I tried to save the babies, but it was too late and the babies were gone. But we tried. We tried, and we have to live with that forever. Rowlett police are mum about the motive, but do say it was not burglary because nothing was taken. They also say this was not random. Now we know that this is a sick individual that took absolutely nothing from our house, but took the most two most important things that were important to us. The family says they not only battled grief now, they battled rumors that they were somehow involved in this violent crime. Gossip is the biggest evil in the world, and unfortunately there's nothing you can do to stop it. And we're not going to make an issue out of this. As for who could so easily snuff the life of two beautiful innocents, the routiers say the murderer can only be described one way. Well, it's just... an animal that goes after, after a, a weak sheep that is asleep, is completely lifeless, and attacks the weakest person in the room first 
to be able to get off on whatever he was thinking he was going to accomplish. The court then says, all right, back on the record, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a 10 minute break now, please. Thank you. And at this point in time, we are also going to cut this because it's getting uh, pretty long in her testimony. Uh, we haven't even gotten into the defense questioning of this yet. So this is uh, like James Cron going to be a multi-part episode. And I'm going to get to that uh, right after this. Okay, so let's kind of go over what Barbara had to say. Now, first of all, we learned that she worked at Kuplex, um, this company where she originally met Darren, and this was around 1987. And at the time, he was 19 years old. Now, he and Darley also at this time were engaged, and Darley was around all of 16 or 17 years old. Barbara didn't actually end up meeting Darley until a few months or even a little bit longer after she had first met and worked with Darren, and then Barbara and Darley became friends, and actually Barbara ended up being Darley's maid of honor in her wedding. Now, Darley, I guess, also worked at Kuplex, but she was pregnant at the time, had some kind of accident, and she wasn't able to work, so she stayed home after that. Darren and Darley were then married in August of 1988, and during a little bit after this, I, from what I gather, Darren developed a business on the side as he was working at Kuplex. And this business was originally out of his home, and Barbara helped him with that. She was paid to help him. Darley also helped, and Darren eventually left Kuplex and went to work for his own company, uh, which he called Test Neck. Now, Barbara, she too left Kuplex and went to work for Darren at Test Neck. Darley kept the books at this test net company, and Barbara and Darren worked on these circuit boards. She said that her daughter, Barbara's daughter, helped sometimes with the company, and someone also named uh, Julie Clark. Barbara then began to testify about how she felt that Darley was very materialistic. And Barbara, for some reason, brought this up to Darren. Barbara was concerned that Darley was buying things all of the time. And, you know, honestly, my first thought is, you know, sorry, why is that her business anyway? So Barbara claimed that no money went back into the company. It just went to Darley. They had also built a new home. Darley decorated the home. She purchased furniture and, quote, beautiful clothes for her and her kids. And then Barbara's talked about how Darley liked to buy jewelry. Now, Barbara also talked to Darley about everything that she was buying. And again, this just struck me as really weird. Anyway, in 1995, business started to get at Tesnex, started to get really slow for an extended period of time. And this was true through the next year into 1996. And she testified that during this time, Darley started to get nervous and depressed and fought with Darren a lot. Uh, evidently, they were frequent fights and arguments about money. She said that the fights increased as the business slowed down. She further claimed that Darley would be doing invoices at the company and then would be on the phone shopping. So I'm not exactly sure what she meant by this. She claimed that Darley had a temper and Darley was the one who essentially wore the pants in the family. She continually talked, Barbara did, about Darley's emotional state and that uh, she even brought this up to Darren. And this is the point when she talks about how Darley has maids there to clean the house and has people to help take care of the kids. And she claimed that the reason that Darley was doing this, hiring all these people, was because she thought that something was wrong with Darley. Now, Barbara and Darren would also keep an eye on the kids at the company while Darley ran errands. Um, not unusual, in my opinion. Barbara then had gone on vacation, and this was around May of 1996. And when she got back, she went to go visit Darley, and that's when Darley told her that she had tried to commit that she had pills out of the wrappers, not exactly sure what she meant there, 
and that she, Darlie, was writing a note. And then Darren happened to walk in. She put all of this stuff away very quickly so that he wouldn't see. The dog then found the wrappers and started playing with them. She said that Darlie told her that she sometimes felt strange and that things were too much for her. And she had said she had already talked to Darren about this, and she was planning on taking the three kids to Lubbock, at Lubbock, Texas, and head to Cyrilda's house, which happens to be Darren's mom, and that's where she lives. But then Darlie told Barbara that she was really concerned about heading to Cyrilda's because if anything happened between her and Darren, that Cyrilda would take the kids from her. So here's my opinion on this, for what it's worth. So here, Barbara is already saying that Darlie is hinting at a problem between her and Darren. Why else would she mention about something happening between her and Darren? This also further shows that she's concerned about losing her kids, that Cyrilda would take them if something did happen between her and Darren. So let's get back to the testimony. Darlie evidently told Barbara that, you know, the neighbor kids would come over often and she felt like sometimes it was too much. Sometimes she liked it. Sometimes it was too much. She never did end up going to Lubbock, um, but she did then go on diet pills because Darlie was concerned about her weight. We then learn that Darlie, this is when Darlie made the request of Barbara saying, hey, could your mom come over and kind of help with some some chores around the house? And her mother agreed. And then Barbara took her mom over to Darlie's on the 4th, which coincides with her mom's testimony. And then she picked up Darren and Darren rode with her to Tesnek because his car was broken down and Darlie needed their other vehicle to run errands. So the next day, which was Wednesday, and this was on June 5th, so just a day before the crime occurred, Barbara again brought her mother over and couldn't remember if she gave Darren a ride to work that day or not. She then came back around 5.15 that afternoon, and because her mom's still at Darley's, and so she has to pick up her mom, so she shows up around 5.15, and then she decided to stick around and have a beer. Then she said that her mom was rushing her to get out of there, and Darley seemed upset and was pacing back and forth. And Barbara's like, hey, I know when Darlie is upset. So honestly, if she knew that she was upset and that her mom wanted to leave, why then hang around and have a beer? So uh, and then this next thing, this is where the discrepancy comes in regarding Barbara's testimony and her mom's testimony. And it really centers around this car. Barbara said that she had parked out in front of the house. And this is what her mom had said. But then her mom, Helena, had said something about coming down a sidewalk. Now, again, this could have just been the front walk. And her mom, Helena, like Barbara, did mention this black car that seemed to go by very quickly. Now, Helena had said that this car had slowed down and someone had gotten into the passenger side. Barbara just said it just drove by really fast. And it was the description of the car, black, it looked like a sports car. But according to Barbara, it passed them as they were going to, they were already in the car and they were going to turn onto Linda Vista from Eagle Drive. So Eagle Drive is where the route here home is and then, you know, down the road. But it wasn't exactly in front of the house when this car sped by. So that's where the discrepancy comes from, uh, from between Barbara's mom, Helena, and Barbara herself. What I also found interesting was that Barbara mentions that as they were leaving the Routier home, she remembers waving to Darren and Dana, who happens to be Darlie's sister. Then she said, later that night or early morning hours, however you want to look at it, at three o'clock in the morning, she had, Barbara, had received a phone call from her daughter saying, hey, there's something going on over at the Routier home. And when she arrived there, there were police and fire trucks. Uh, they were already there. The house had already been taped off. And in the front of the house, she spoke with her daughter and Dana and then to a policeman. Now, my question is, 
Why was Dana there? Did she ever leave the house after she arrived with Darren? I thought way back at the beginning when Darren and Darley were giving their initial statements, written statements to the police before Darley was even arrested, that Dana was there for dinner, but that Darren had taken her home, which means that she would have needed a ride home and had no transportation of her own. So how did she get there so fast? Unless she just never left. But this would also mean that she would have been a witness to the crime, wouldn't it? Or at least she would have been in the vicinity. So at this point, what I'm going to do, I'm actually inserting this in the middle because I had to go back and check out these statements. And here's what I did find. So Darley is the one in her initial statement to the police said that uh, Darren or Darren and Darley, they had gotten home from the office. Dana stayed there at the house and they all just sat around and watched TV after dinner. And this happened after dinner. And then she, Darley, asked Darren to drive Dana home because Darley wasn't feeling well. This is in her original police statement, handwritten statement, prior to her arrest and prior to you know any of this trial occurring. So that was Darley's statement. Darren's first statement doesn't even mention this part about Dana. He is directly, his statement literally starts like, hey, once he gets back, they're sitting in the, what they call the Roman room, which is the den area with the TV, and um, talking about how they had this conversation, just him and Darley, and that Drake got tired, and they had to take Drake up to bed. So. Those were the two initial statements prior to any of this trial, any of the arrests, anything. But in the motion to hold Darley without bond, and this is, I'll have the actual show number in the show notes for you so you can go back and listen to this if you want to. This was way prior to the trial. And Darren is on the stand for this motion to hold Darley without bond. And this is when he actually does talk about whether or not he took Dana home. And he says here that he left to take Dana back to her place around nine o'clock. And he said that the reason that he took her home was because she didn't have a car. He then says that he got back about 940 p.m. somewhere in there. They ask him, how are you sure it was 940? And he says, I know because it was before the news was on television. But then in this motion, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, you can listen to it if you want to. But another interesting part is that there is a question that is put to Darren about he, the question is, you have not had any discussions with Darley being angry with your activities with Dana? And he says, with Dana? And he says, yes, sir. Her sister? Dana, your sister-in-law? No. Never have? No. Did you ever become aware that Dana and Darley may have spoken about you, what you and Dana had been doing in the past? And Darren answers, no. And the question then is, that just never came to your attention? No, I have known Dana since she was three years old. You have flirted with Dana in the past, haven't you? And he says, flirted? No. It's like, okay, well, had you done something with Dana that others might call flirting? He says, I wouldn't think so. That's my sister-in-law. And then the attorney says, all right. And again, I will have the number of this episode in the show notes so you can actually listen to the entire amount of Darren's testimony. And again, this is for the motion to hold the defendant without bond. So I just wanted to interject that in here because it's important in the context of this particular information as to why maybe Dana was at the residence at three o'clock in the morning, at least according to Barbara. And it's at this point, after the video was shown, that the court then decides to take this 10 minute break. So of course, after the video, everybody's got like this extra 10 minutes to sit there and kind of absorb what it is that they had seen. 
So anyhow, that's how this portion of the testimony ended. Uh, the next portion will pick up right after this video was shown. So look forward to that. That's coming very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I appreciate you all. Please, if you're enjoying this, don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. And we will talk very, very soon.